McCormick on Game Changers. Hi. Eric. Thanks for having me, Vic. Eric, you are, we're going to cheat. We're going to cheat so that they can All see. Right, they, okay. We have to show them your face right, because I want you to know that every woman that I know has begged me if they could bring dinner over after and come Boy, over. That's going to be filling. <laughs> it's going to be filling. But I said no to all of them, though. But I'm, I'm not very popular for that. But you are so loved. You are, see, we can't. It, it's impossible. I know it's impossible. This I have to look at you. I have to look at you. I'm just going to sit back up. Right. We'll back up. We'll back up and we'll, because, yes, Eric. Hi. Beautiful house. This is the first uh, Game Changers that you're doing from this home. This home. It's the first. It's beautiful. You are our you can't see. You can't see it, but we can see the mountains, which I, I unbelievably have snow on them. This they never do. happens. It's crazy. In Los Angeles, right from their kitchen window, somebody. We drove home in a blizzard, in a whiteout from Las Vegas the other day. Yes. Seeing Lauren. Our, okay, yes. so tell me how you met Lauren Gold. Oh, so I, so now, I now I know Vicky because of, of my old friend Lauren Gold, who um, is my, my rock star pal. We met years ago. Well, he, he'd already been a rock star for some time, but he hadn't yet done. When I called him years later and said, hey, we met years ago. You want to do something with me? He said, well, right now I'm playing with The Who. <laughs> I said, you're joking. And now he not only plays with The Who, he plays with Chicago. So when he's not with one, he's with the other. I mean, he is classic rock. Lauren Gold. He's he's a rock star. So right. so how did you guys meet? Um, it was it was a benefit. It was an AIDS benefit here in Los Angeles, and uh, I was just saying to your husband to, to, to Snuffy that um, normally it's whoever plays a show like that is the musical director is someone from musical theater, and there was Lauren with his long black hair, <laughs> and very rock and roll. And I thought, this is cool. <laughs> And he kind of looked up as if to say, okay, what musical theater song are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to do like some Elton John or Billy Joel. And he was like, you are? <laughs> so we became instant, uh, instant friends. And sushi friends. and Sushi friends. And, and going uh, to, all right, how do you know Elton? Oh, come on. Well, so, I mean, uh, first of all, growing up, you know, I grew up in, in Toronto and uh, I didn't, I wasn't one of those guys that had a lot of friends. I, 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 my, my, I was my Stop. own, I was my own best friend in my bedroom. And so my best friends were Freddie Mercury and Elton John, and, and everyone I pretended in my mind that I either knew or was pretending to be. Um, Elton was a big one for me. Um, my one sort of safe, saving grace was was theater, and grace, I, 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 I used to do I, I used to do Godspell and Pippa and all these things. Oh. And in all of those shows with me in high school uh, was David Furnish, who is now Elton John's husband. So, f over 40 years, I've, I've known David and loved David. Oh, you really knew David? Oh, David and I were like, Pat, we, we, I can show you pictures of us doing Godspell and Pippin in, in 11, here, 19, 1980. We did that, yeah, 1881, and wow. the Fantastics. Um, so, years later, we sort of got in touch again. And, he's, and he was, yeah, uh, basically, we have a mutual friend, and I said, do you ever talk to Dave anymore? She said, yeah, he's, uh, he's in London, he's doing well. He's <laughs> dating Elton John. <laughs> So, uh, so we, we, we sort of hooked up again and we started going down. Now my wife and I are, go every year um, at, to the Elton John AIDS Foundation uh, fundraiser on Oscar night. And we, I'm one of the co-hosts this year with them. And I want to break in to ask you about this because you are very philanthropic. You are, very, you are involved in lots of charities. I, I have a, a, a long list of them here. Project Angel, Angel Food, food here in Los Breast Angeles. Cancer, yes. Melanoma, a lot of things. Um, um, I, I don't want to say same-sex marriage. I want to use, be politically correct. Uh, yes, marriage equality. Marriage That's equality. Right. Okay, yes, I did. My absolutely. daughter is now rolling her eyes that I said it wrong, <laughs> and she's watching. This is the only show of mine she's ever watching because of you, because she loves you. Hi, <laughs> Samantha. Hi, hi. Nice to see you. Uh, so. What brought this into your life? Were you always this way? Were your parents this way? How did you become? No, really, I, I got to give full credit to my wife, Janet, um, honestly, because I, I, you know, looking back, I think mm -hmm. I was a pretty typical actor. I was just focused on me and what I had to do and <laughs> getting by and getting the next job. And it was, I, I, Janet and I got married six months before Will and Grace happened. Okay, so, so you guys met on Lonesome Dove. We met on Lonesome Dove, the, uh, the series, in 1994, uh, and... Uh, was that like magic from... It was like kind of magic, yeah. And she was very different than 
any girl I did. She wasn't an actress, she was a, a third AD on Lonesome and Dove and, and from Alberta where we were shooting and boots and jeans and then a pickup truck that she knew how to fix. Get out of and, here. You know, the walkie on the hip and I was just like, uh, oh, this is different. This is, she could hurt me. Uh, and yeah, we were by this, you know, six months in, we were, we were together, and that was uh, 28 years ago. That's... Uh, which is kind of amazing. But she was the one that when we, when we first, we were invited uh, in the first season of Will and Grace to a Project Angel Food fundraiser. And <clears throat> it was an amazing organization that, that uh, at the time was, it would, would feed people uh, living with HIV AIDS. And now they've spread their net even wider. They do an incredible job here in, here in L.A. Um, but we went to this event and they were honoring Deborah Messing and I or something. We hadn't done anything. We just were on television. <laughs> and, you know, Janet said, well, we have to do something. We have to give back. I said, well, let's, let's go to the silent auction table. And Janet said, well, no, I'm going to deliver meals. So, you know, within about five years, she was on the board uh, wow. of them. So she's, she's always the one stopping and giving money to someone on the street. or the, She's just incredibly kind person and uh, who just says we, we have to give back whenever we can. So it, it really started with Angel Food, but also um, the Human Rights Campaign. Anything because Will and Grace was what it was. It was the first very openly prominently, uh, prominent show that featured two, two gay roles. And it was just like, this is how I can use my power for good, is by, is by being this character and, and taking this... Did you have any hesitancy about playing a gay character? No. By the time I... None? The, not, not really, because I had already played uh, like a half dozen of them <laughs> by that time. I, I, in the theater and on television in two or three different series, I, I guest starred uh, as a gay character. And I'm from the theater. I mean, there's nothing weird about that to me. What all the, the only thing that scared me, I've said this before, is that it, I think any role would have scared me when because I realized how... I was probably going to get it. I just, I, could, I got those vibes. And I okay, got... so let's talk about that. So I want to go back and how you got into theater to begin with, but Will and Grace. So you audition, I assume you, they don't just hand you the part? Oh, God, no, no, no. I was nobody, uh, not being handed anything at the time, but I was, I was long in the tooth. I was 34. At the wow. Time. You know, and the Friends cast was mostly like, like 10 years younger. So... I'd been around, I'd done a lot of theater in Canada, I'd done a number of pilot seasons uh, in LA, and, but by this point, I knew who I was, I knew it was time, if I was, if I was gonna make it at all, and it, I'd, I'd honed my desires so much so that I thought I'd want to be on a must-see TV sitcom directed by Jim Burroughs. Like, I, I, no, I, I feel you like I, oh, yeah. I feel thing. like I almost did, because it was, I just, I could see 40, and I was like, I'm not getting to 40. <laughs> without something that I've dreamed of. And so uh, when I read this role, that's what I saw. I didn't, uh, and, and, and to be honest, I, when I said the, the fact that he was a gay character, I was like, this could be my in, because, you you know, in, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not a macho guy. I'm not gonna, you know, be the lead on CSI Burbank. I'm, I'm probably. Although Travelers, yeah. you're kind, well, the you're Travelers kind of came, older, you're kind of Travelers older. came later, and, uh, and, I, and that was you finally, that. I grew into that. <laughs> But at the time, I really just wanted, I just the idea of doing a great, well-written sitcom was happy. And, uh, okay, so you're the first one cast, are you not? I was the first one cast at Blue yeah. Okay, so now, how, what's the process? I know the answer to this, but the folks at home might not. So what's the process of getting, getting your grace? Um, well, so, f uh, I, I... Wait, so what did you have to do to get to, to Oh, it's just, you know, you do a scene or, or two, and, um... I just felt that in the room with uh, Max and David, who created the show from that first read, there was a sense of like, this is this is who we need in this part. I I hadn't even read uh, the Jack or Karen roles. All I saw was it was Will and Grace sides, yeah, with just a, a Will mm -hmm. and Grace thing. I think it was a park bench scene that never even really existed in the show. And then when I finally got the role, I read with I don't know half a dozen. Okay, time. wait, go back a little bit, because I heard that you might have had to read in front of the director, perhaps. Oh, well, yes, for sure. Um, I, I did one for, another one for them after after Christmas, and then one for the studio, and, and people always go through, you know, five. And but you didn't know who but the director was, did I, you? I hadn't heard yet, no, and just before I, I thought, okay, I'm going to network, uh, 
they said, oh, you have to read for Jimmy. And I just, Jimmy Burroughs. <laughs> he used to say, say the B word. I said, yes, Jimmy Burroughs. And I'm like, read for Jimmy and he was like, no, okay, that's great. No, he's the better. <laughs> so, but, so I ended up going to network um, with one actress and I thought, this is it. Either either we're Will and Grace or we're not. And I, I didn't think there was a chance that one of us would get it and the other wouldn't. But that's what happened. I They approved me and then I had about a, almost Had a she month. been approved and then they fired her? Or it was wasn't about being fired. You, you, to go to network, you just, you, you don't have the job yet. Okay. You have to behave as if. The, yes. Your agents have to have the contract worked out, but it doesn't guarantee you anything. And I did that on a number of... Uh, a number of pilots. Everybody does. Everybody, even George Clooney, I think, did twelve pilots that never got picked up. You know, isn't that amazing? Yeah, yes, I mean, it's you, <clears throat> it's it's what uh, you yeah. know that pilot season is this crazy, like greyhounds chasing a, a, a <laughs> rabbit around the track. You you may or you may not, and even if you get something, there's no guarantee it's going to go or that it's going to be good. Yes. So that's why uh, something like Will and Grace was just a lightning in a bottle, as Jimmy always said. Just one of those. Okay, so when so this woman didn't make it with you? Uh, didn't uh, didn't make it. Um, it was, uh, but I, I don't mind telling the story because she was fantastic, uh, and she went on to to be Marin Hinkle, yeah, Marin Hinkle star of uh, uh, Mrs. Um, I'm sorry, Magdi I was going to say the Magnificent <laughs> Mrs. Marvel. That's not right. Ma Ma Maisel. <laughs> She's so one of the great stars and, and Emmy nominated and uh, of Maisel. She was on um, Two and a Half Men Rachel. for years. Yeah. Rachel. Um, yeah. So, but it was just it was just not the right fit at right. that moment. And I read with several other actresses over the course of uh, of a month, and then the very last one, which is I think the one they were just crossing fingers and toes mm -hmm. on, was Deborah, and uh, the chemistry was fantastic. Yes, it kind of paid off in, kind of in a big way. Okay, so now let's go back. So you're a little kid. You're in Toronto. No, I'm in Toronto. Toronto. Yes, yeah. and um, and what and. Obviously, singing, dancing, doing theater always. Yeah. What, was, what, 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 what sparked that life? It was, I didn't do anything else. There was no sports Never. in my life. No, I mean, from, from a little kid, the games I would play, my imaginary games in the backyard, or I mean, even a, <laughs> play, playing cops and robbers with a couple of friends. For them, they were just, you know, killing time to lunch, and I was rolling <laughs> credits in my brain. I, I could see the shots, I knew everything was a television show to me. So I, uh, I, I was in a musical in like first grade. I'm you looking know? at the shot and I'm like, I, I don't, yeah, no, you look, and, and I have like all this what? bulk going on. <laughs> I'm like, look at that, I'm looking at this shot, it's horrible. Um, and then I have to go to, I'm going to go to I can't look at the shot because it's no, a little delay. No, so don't, 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 yeah, don't look at the shot. Um, so yeah, I, I just always did it all through elementary school. It was all theater and, and, uh, and characters. <clears throat> and um, I won a few speech arts awards for, for doing stuff in like seventh grade, eighth grade. And then when I discovered... The musical in high school, that was sort of... There was what no was the first musical? Back. I guess technically the first one I was in, in, in the chorus was uh, Annie Get Your Gun. Oh, right. <laughs> and, and then when you... What was your first lead? It was Godspell. So, 11th grade, I was the youngest guy in the class. I, I kind of moved up a year into David Furnish's class. and uh, That's helped, crazy. Yeah. And uh, we all had to audition, even though we were in the class, we still had to audition for different roles. And I went in, I didn't know any musical theater songs, I didn't know anything. So I did I did a song by Deep Purple. Oh, come you and, are, yeah. get out. No, I did exactly. a David Bromberg from my audition. Wait, you, what's, what, David, what Deep Purple song uh, did you do? Sweet Stop. Child in Time, <laughs> which is 11 minutes long. <laughs> and nobody had told me what to the, how to do this? So I just started doing it, and it, it starts really quiet. I was doing it totally a cappella. Sweet child in time, you'll see the light. And then it kept going, and it kept going. And then I built into this. And then my teacher's like, wait, wait, okay, okay, hey, hey, stop. It's fine. That's how long is it? I said, oh, it was under five minutes. He said, no, no, you're good. But uh, yeah, so and that I, I will always measure my. I, I joke sometimes that I. I, I played Christ, but I, I measured my life in BC and AD, and it was literally before playing that part and after. And it wasn't even there wasn't even the performances that we did at night. I think we did two of them, as you do in high school. 
it was the the assembly. It was the stu all the students coming mm -hmm. in. They're all sitting there, like having to sit through this stuff at ten in the morning. And we showed them the first two songs, the opening number and the, and my and Jesus Jesus's first <laughs> song. And that moment when I finished the song called "Save the People," and I'm just wearing shorts and nothing else, and I hit the deck like this, and I finished that big note, and the cast is all around, and as a, I think I was waiting for crickets. Like, I was just waiting until like, people were going, how is this? Instead, everybody went crazy because all they'd seen is Annie Get Your Gun and, you know, wow. Music Man and stuff. They hadn't seen something more current. current. Yeah. And suddenly my peers were applauding and accepting me. And that's when life began. Okay, so when you were a little kid. Yeah. What did you have? Because I read this and I'm trying to pull it out of you. Did you? Did somebody <laughs> inspire you? Something? Well, did yeah. It's, it's it's not something that that uh, American audiences will know. Um, oh. I don't think. Maybe you're heading a different direction. I, um, I think I am. But what was? I had a couple of major influences. Okay. Uh, and and one was a, a Canadian kids show called Mr. Dress Up. <laughs> um, it's pretty. It was so perfect. Pretty literal. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and Mr. Dress Up had what he called a tickle trunk. And out of it every it was, uh, every morning, and he would pull it out. Every every town has some version of, of this, but he he would pull out a different a pirate or or a clown, and he would go into character. I just thought that's I want to do that for a living. I, you know, the world is my tickle trunk. <laughs> but he also had uh, two little puppets, Casey and Finnegan, and that's where I got Finnegan. My, Janet and I called our son after the, uh, after the puppet the on puppet. But another big another t the other two big ones for me. One was Mel Blanc. Um, who was the voice of, uh, I, I, when I realized that one guy did all of the voices for all of the Looney Tunes characters, one guy, uh, that shaped my world. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that on a visual level, Mr. Dresden did. It's like, you can become anything. Um, and then I guess the third one I always name is, uh, is uh, Don Adams. That's what I was hoping. I know. You know why? You're probably, fr you're friends with, with his daughter. No. Because 99 is doing this show in, in three weeks. I'm coming Barbara back. Barbara Feldon I'm is doing back. this. Oh my God! She's so lovely. I'm coming back. Me, I'm going to show up and spread it. Um, <laughs> that's so great. I know. Um, Barbara Feldon lovely. and Elizabeth Montgomery from Bewitched. You know, I'm you know I'm eight yeah. years old and I'm like this is good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 be happy with this harem. Uh, <laughs> but Get Smart in reruns after school was. It was absolutely my everything. It, it definitely shaped me comedically. Mm. Uh, everything Don Adams did, and 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 Barbara Feldman. I mean, she was. Did you ever get to meet him? I got to meet both of them <gasps> together. Stop. At uh, it was the NBC. You know everybody. It was NBC's seventy fifth birthday, mm -hmm. which was a great, huge special they put on. It was right during Will and Grace early days, and um, everybody from the network was on and doing something, and I did. A number of about theme songs, great TV theme songs, all from NBC, of course. Uh huh. Uh, and it was me and Martin Short and Will Ferrell oh, singing gosh. these songs. Oh my God. Um, and uh, it was this great bit. But afterwards, or maybe it was beforehand, at the at the party at, at the top of Thirty Rock, there was Don Adams and Barbara Feldman. Oh God. And uh, I don't think she'd seen the show. I don't think she'd do anything. I don't even know that uh, that Don had. But Don's daughter introduced us. Cecily, she married um, Jim Beaver, who's a friend of mine, yes. Well, okay. so, and it was, heaven and I got to tell him everything I always wanted oh. to tell him. But the upshot of the story, this is so great, this is, I, within a year, there was a, uh, a Paley Center look back at Get Smart, and it was the two of them on stage, and Bernie Koppel, and, uh, and oh, um, Leonard Goldberg, who had, you know, produced it. And so, and I'm in the audience with my wife, and I went backstage first just to say hello again, if you remember me, we met the NBC thing. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> and, uh, but nobody knows I'm there. It's not an audience of celebrities or right, anything. Right. And somebody, this is before the Steve Carell movie, somebody said, will there ever be a Get Smart movie? And before Leonard Goldberg could sort of say, well, there's a lot of legalities involved, we don't know yet, Dawn went, if there ever is, I want Eric to play me. I'm in the dark. Nobody, nobody knows who he's talking about at all. Oh it was just this very strange hug, hung in the air, and I went, I kind of waved. I said, "Thank you, Don. Thank you." And he said, "Absolutely." And then it never got. No one, Leonard, Bernie, no one knew who the hell he was talking about. 
but I know in that moment. Wow, and okay, so that's like a dream. Because I used to play that game with my buddy Bill. We would just play Get Smart. We'd watch the show, and then for an hour and a half, we'd be spotted. I have to take off my shoe now. And yes, talk exactly. To my, <laughs> talk to my shoe. That is, that is a beautiful, beautiful moment. That, beautiful. That Those little ones that just, because it really, wow. for me, I know a lot of actors found it later. They're in college, whatever. They mm. found, for me, it's all about make-believe, and it's about making dreams come true. I mean, everything I do is related to something I felt as, as a little kid. Uh, a game I played, a musician I always wanted to meet. Um, I have no pr problem ever admitting that I, I ape certain people. It's just, it, I, it's like I steal that from you and I steal that from you. And I love that. And I love that you're like a fanboy, like the rest of like, oh, yes. the <laughs> The picture of when you I, and Lauren yeah. flanking Elton, holding his like <laughs> rings. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Elton uh, yeah, was, a, was a huge one for me, and he, he knows it. I mean, I, when I finally got a chance to tell him... Yeah, but you have, uh, like, a more intimate relationship. Well, now I, he knows, David. we know each other, but when I first met him, I always, I always tell the story, we had dinner, the four of us, uh, my wife and I and David and Elton at uh, one of the restaurants in Hollywood. And, of course and he was did. being very shy, he was very quiet. And I'm dying to ask really geeky <laughs> fan questions, really geeky stuff. <laughs> I, I thought, I don't want to bore him, or I don't want to piss him off. And he said, it finally said to me, can I ask you something? I said, can you ask? Yeah. <laughs> well, why? He said, is Sean Hayes really that funny? <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, now I get to ask anything I want. <laughs> so what, what it, yeah. can you remember something you asked him? I don't know what I asked him that night, but I, not long after, uh, I went to see, it was him and Billy Joel playing together. Remember that tour? Yes. I went backstage beforehand to say hello, and he, I uh, walk into his dressing room and he says, hello, gorgeous, and give me a hug, and then he says, you know Bernie, and Bernie Toppin is standing beside him, so I hadn't met Bernie yet, and I'm standing looking at Elton John and Bernie Toppin at the same time, and I said, I've got to ask something that I'll, I'll when will I ever get this chance again? I said, can I ask you guys a question? And he said, yeah, whatever you want. I said, okay, on the Captain Fantastic album, with the original lyric book, there's lyrics to a song right at the beginning called Dogs in the Kitchen, and it's not on the album. I've never heard it. Why are the lyrics there, but the, the song doesn't exist? And these guys just stared at me, looked at each other, and went, oh, I don't know. I don't remember that. I told, <laughs> no, you're, you're talking about it. I said, Bernie, you don't remember writing a song called Dogs in the Kitchen? The words are there. He says, no, I don't remember that. <laughs> so that's why getting too geeky sometimes blows up here. Yeah, when, yeah. That's why I have to be careful when I tell people that I'll ask you questions. Sometimes they tell me to ask something that oh, has yeah, actually sure. nothing to do with you, or that, you know, a movie that you weren't in, yeah. a TV uh -huh. show that you had nothing to do with. So I have to be really careful. So I'm not, uh, everybody, I love you, and I'm so glad that you, I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying this on my <laughs> computer because I'm usually zooming, but I love you, and I'm so glad that you're here, and I'm not looking at your questions now because I'm asking Eric all of mine first. Okay. So. I thought you said you're usually exhuming, and I say, that's pretty much what you're doing right now. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so <clears throat> mom, dad, how do they feel about their little boy who's doing all of this stuff? Um, I've often said that my, my parents passed away uh, 14 and 16 years ago, and um, or more now, jeez. And um, th I, they were incredibly supportive, and they were from the get go. From, from yeah, from the get go, they were wonderful. Wow. But I've learned that I think both of them were. They didn't. They had dreams that perhaps they didn't make come true, and I learned that really with my father first. In showbiz, or other well, things? that's what I say. No, they just. I mean, they were. They just lived that life, that fifties, sixties life, where you know he got a good job and they had a, a, a nice house in the suburbs, and mm -hmm. it was all great. But excuse me, I discovered um, when what I was in. Well, he was a financial analyst for Shell Oil. Oh wow, serious? Okay. Went to university in Toronto for for business, but I discovered in the attic photos mm -hmm. of him as an actor. He was, he totally wanted to be an actor. He graduated from the same school as I did. He never told me. Um, he never told never you? Never told me. Right for radio and television arts. This is in 52. Wow. When it was not, I suppose, real practical to, um, mm -hmm. unless you turned out to be Lauren Green or eventually Bill <laughs> Shatner. There just wasn't a giant um, series of success stories coming out of Canada when it came to acting or television. So. He backed off, and, and I never got a real straight answer out of him about 
what that moment was and why. But I certainly never got an answer about why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you say, well, I tried that stuff. He, he just, it was like he buried something. Like, it's just, nope, that's... And so I think his support of and pride in me had a lot to do with I was carrying on something, and it wasn't because he pushed me. It wasn't so like some, you know, washed-up football star that is pushing his kid to to be a quarterback. Yeah. He let me find right. it all on my own, and I I'll always appreciate that. But it's always part of me too going, but you couldn't mention it once. <laughs> I'm doing. We, I did a production of Antigone in theater school, at the same theater school he went to, wow. and he had done Antigone at school. I mean, it was like, when did you find all this out? About my second year in school. And how did you find out? Uh, like I said, it was photos in an oh, ad. I found a photo album, and, and I just went to my mother and I said, "I don't." And she said, "It's just he just put it away one day." And was she as supportive as well? Yeah, for sure. And they never worried about you. They never thought. I'm sure they worried a lot, you know. And I and I don't. I realize now because my son's just uh, about turned twenty one, and and it's like the the things that we worry about that he probably doesn't even realize we're worried about. I don't know. I certainly didn't think about it. I didn't think, uh, am I keeping them up nights because I'm doing dinner theater? I don't know. I, I just didn't. So did you ever have to have a job job? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's hear. Let's hear some job jobs. Um, <laughs> they were all, I must say, they were, they were all before I went. To, I, my first real job, not, that's not true, my first big job in the theater was... Uh, for a Shakespeare company. I haven't worked a real job since then. That was 85. So I've been very lucky. But before then, I worked a series. I keep trying to tell my son this. Like, we used to do a lot of jobs. We would do anything. Like we'd what? do two jobs at once. So I worked, I worked at Baskin Robbins for two yes. years. I worked at a, at a gas station. I worked at two different men's stores trying to, you know, to sell. I see that. Yeah. But I was just the sweater and, and sock guy. But, uh, but yeah, and, and there's no question that it gave me so much. I, I mean, if, if nothing else, it gave me, I, I'm not going to do this for the rest of my life. I know that I have to put in the, the time and the effort. I, I've got to make my dreams come true. No okay, one else so is going to do it for me. How, how did you transition from having to have a job job to being a working, paid, full-time actor? Um, it was my third year of theater school. It was only a three-year program. And we bunch of us auditioned for the Stratford Shakespeare Festival in Canada, which is a gigantic, huge uh, thing where you, you work nine months of the year. You do sh uh, plays in rep. And um, I auditioned in, I guess, November of 84. I got the job a month later, which meant I had to leave school early. Uh, oh, which was and how did your parents handle that? They were okay, because I was, I mean, I think they knew that I was... The school didn't handle well. They were like, you have to stay for April. I said, to do what, plays? I'm going to do plays that they'll pay me for. Um, but I did have a job at the time. I was working at a men's store, downtown Toronto. And the last day I worked that job was uh, what we call Boxing Day in Canada, the day yes. after Christmas. Mm -hmm. Big sales. And I remember just being on a cloud going, I... I'm never gonna doesn't do matter if I sell stuff. If I would steal it, I don't care. I'm going. I'm, I got work coming up, and that was and that was it. February of '85. I started. And did you know? Did you know this is it? I'm not doing this anymore. I didn't know, but I knew that. I, I knew that my that instinct that said this is what you're supposed to do mm -hmm. got a little bit more validated. So you did the Shakespeare Company, and then how? And then, and then what happened? That was five years. Five years wow. with them, and in every winter between uh, seasons, I would go and do other work, sometimes other Shakespeare across Canada. Um, oh, I so I, it was. Fun. I wouldn't give to see you huh. doing Shakespeare. <laughs> Don't give do. too much. No, I would give because even I realized at the end of five seasons that it was that. There are other people doing this better than So, me. like, what roles did you have when you were in the theater? Well, company? nothing huge. Like, I never... I did do Romeo, uh, but not Stratford. I did it at another... Olivia at Hussey watches sometimes. Does she? She does! Now, was that Franco Zeffirelli, like, version of Romeo and Juliet, like, the most beautiful thing ever? It's very beautiful. I don't think she had the greatest time, all right? So, Olivia was talking a little lately about that it was... That was not... Really? Because she, she, she always was, posts... But she posts pictures like I know. And it's, and she's she gorgeous. Great time. I, I think it was... She was... You know, well, I know she was young and she was a little... Some of the love scenes I read were, yeah. you know, 
but it was what it was 1968. Like everybody was naked, so it was. Um, I, I think what people took for granted at the time. Now we look back and go, "Wow, she was so freaking young." She was so young. She was really fourteen. I know. Yeah, so, she was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, and probably really naked, but but okay. So, so it was a Romeo, and then um, but mostly at Stratford, I, ha I, w I had a wonderful mentor there, John Neville. Now he is a legend in Canada, but he's, he's English. John Neville played the lead in a movie, a Terry Gilliam movie called The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Yeah, sure. And he he was someone that after my first year there, when artistic directors changed, sort of plucked me. I wouldn't say plucked me out of the chorus, but he. He had me in mind, but he didn't suddenly hand me Hamlet or something. He just knew I needed time. And so I never had giant roles there, but he brought me along slowly. And mm -hmm. I will always give John credit for supporting me, but also criticizing me mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the ways that I, that I needed. Um, there was a... <laughs> Uh, Did you begrudge the lead actors that were getting those roles, or were you no, okay with No, some of the le leads that were certainly older than me, mm -hmm. and I was learning from them. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great ones was just a little older than me, Colin Fiore. Mm -hmm. You may know Colin. I mean, he was, and still is, one of the giants of the Stratford Festival. And I was understudying him in a couple of roles. And to watch Colin, I'd go, yeah, this is how this is done. I'm not sure this is what I'm cut out to do. I think, because I was already so... Get smart, all of the family. In my mind, I was mash. Like in my mind, slowly, I was starting to think this is maybe. And, and sure enough, at the end of five seasons, I I realized with the help of the new incoming artistic director that perhaps he said to me, "I'm not sure I love the way you play lovers. It's very, it's very modern, isn't it?" And I said, "Yeah, I guess it is." Uh, he said, um, "You ever thought about television comedy?" And he didn't mean it in a nice way, but, um, but oh, he was right. That was eight years before Wilmer, so. He was right, he was and, um, and that was not a bad mm -mm. move for you at all. No, it did, and it took time. Like I said, it was eight, I just started doing television around 90. Okay, so how did that, how did you get your first You know, you role? just, you start auditioning where you are. Well, did I you was have an in, agent? In Toronto, I had an agent. How did you get your agent? It was in the early days of, <clears throat> of the festival. I, I think I just walked in and said, Here's, I've done these five plays, you know. And, um, but that was an agency dealing in just what's in Toronto, mostly. Mm -hmm. And that, what was in Toronto was a few Canadian shows and almost it, very few other things. Maybe an American film coming mm -hmm. through. But, um, so again, I just grew slowly. I didn't explode in anything. I, in 92, I'd done a few things. I moved to Vancouver. Suddenly I was doing a lot more work in American shows because mm -hmm. so many of them shoot mm -hmm. in Vancouver, we're just starting to at the time. Um, I was gonna say, back then, that was pretty early for Vancouver, right? Well, right, with 21 Jump Street was the big mm -hmm. show, which is an American show, and um, Stephen J. Cannell was the producer mm -hmm. of oh, all these shows. Some of them not great. Yeah. Um, and my first series I ever got a regular role on was called um, Street Justice. Mm -hmm. It was Carl Weathers and I, mm -hmm. as cops. And, um, and I knew cops. as cops. <laughs> I'm not, you know, um, but I, but I, I loved, I just, I loved having a gig. I loved having a character week after week. I loved bringing, I loved going to the writers and seeing what they were writing and pitching this and, you know, it's just, I, I, there's something about it that there's a reason that that's what's been my dominant thing more than say film. And, and are you singing during, are you? Are you singing, dancing? Are you training? Are um, you doing this stuff? I'm not long? training at the time, mm -hmm. and singing was just sort of always there. Did but you study it? I studied it in school, okay. and I, I studied it uh, at the Band School of Fine Arts as well uh, one summer. But um, generally, I wasn't taking lessons. It wasn't the, it wasn't my primary focus. Mm -hmm. It was just occasionally a musical would come up. Uh, and I do that, but um, mostly from ninety about ninety one on, it was about karaoke. <laughs> karaoke became That's what Lauren told so me. true. It's so true. <laughs> and everybody, if you think if, if you think you know what I'm talking about, you're like, oh, those little bars people go and say. No, I'm, I'm talking about bars. I'm talking about at home. <laughs> right now, you can karaoke. Right now, if you've never done it, before, you can go on a, an app called Carafun. I'm going to give them free publicity. <laughs> And download it, you can sing anything you want. Uh, but I, I credit that constant, because in the old days we would go to karaoke bars and sing a lot. 
And I, keep, I credit that with keeping me sort of alive. Uh, now, but, but wait, there had to come a point where you could no longer go to karaoke bars because everybody would freak out that you were in there, no? Necessarily. Once, you know, once in a while that was kind of fun, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, they don't say your name, it's Eric's up next, and you just get up and people notice that they don't, but it was... Uh, wow. It's, it's been a huge... Lauren told huge, me that you guys karaoke. We do. Well, when Lauren's around, we usually play the piano, and, and, right. uh, but, but yeah, it's, I, I just think, I think everybody should sing. All the time, I really do, I really and I think cool. that karaoke, particularly when you can have it as part of your, you know, have a dinner party and then everybody sings. I just think it's healthy. <laughs> it's healthy. Okay, so I I don't know if this is your Broadway debut, but I do know that you replaced my friend Craig Bierko in The Music Man. It was my Broadway debut. Okay, now, oh my God, what the hell is that like for you? So it was twenty two years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, I, I just hadn't really, I sort of bypassed New York altogether. Even though I was all theater for so long, I just I was terrified of, of making that. Was that you know, a dream? Was that a thing? Oh sure, as someone on the stage for 10 years, I, uh, it was a big dream, but I, it seemed out of reach somehow. I just didn't seem like I could just go to New York. And um, So when Will and Grace is in its going into its third year, and I got this offer to come to New York to take over the role of the cat in the hat in the music, in the, in what was it called, in, uh, in Susical, the Sus musical. Really? Yeah, just come, see, if, see the show. If you like it, we'll offer you the part. So I went to say, but just before that, I had read that Craig was leaving this acclaimed production of The Music Man. Susan Strong. Yeah. And I don't remember the moment, but I just remember at the time I... Full, filled with a lot of bravado, and I just went, I can do that, I know the music man, I can do that. So I said, will you also, I think it was the same producers, said, I said, could I also see the music man? And of course, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, afterwards, I just said to my wife, I, I need to, I need to play that part. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you have to sing for Stroman, and you have to do a scene with uh, the late and wonderful Rebecca Luger. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, I said, of course, of course, of course. I flew back after singing with a coach for a week and, and I got the part. And so it was four months of just, I was joyous. I loved it. Well, what was that feeling the first time you walked out on a Broadway stage? Did your parents come? They eventually did. They didn't come for the first night. Um, well, that's probably better. Probably better. So I, I, I rehearsed two weeks with no one except a, a, an assistant musical director and one actress, uh, my dear friend Cynthia Leheim who uh, played all the other parts, you know, in a rehearsal room for two weeks. That's it. And then... No, on, they yeah. didn't just throw you out yeah. there. And then on no. the... I think it was the Sunday night, or maybe perhaps it was the Monday that everyone's day off, I got to sort of run through it, just my bits, with a cast not in costume. Uh, I don't think there were any kids, because they couldn't... But it was rules. Right. So the first time I went on and did the show full blast was the first time I'd ever done it. On a Tuesday night, and uh, Sean and Deborah and Megan were in the audience. Oh. God bless them. Uh, and it was it was fantastic. It was I, I like I say I was I, it terrifying. I don't remember. I, I remember being so f full of bluster that I don't even remember being terrified. I love that. Um, when I think back to it, I'm, I I'd be more terrified. But okay. So speaking of which, you're going back to Broadway. You're going back to Broadway. I'm very excited. Yes. With um, our friend. I'm going to say our friend because. Yes. Thanks to Nancy, he did my show. With, with Jason Alexander. Jason Alexander is... The first time, right? So, Jason directed me in a production of The Fantastics at Reprise oh. Theatre here in L.A. His Broadway debut, I should Yes, directorial exactly. Debut. Okay. So, he had been directing quite a bit. Yes. Um, but this was the first time he and I, we knew each other a little bit from school. How long school, ago was this? 12 years ago. Okay. And, um... And had a great time, hit it off, and we've, we've stayed friends, and we've been sort of talking about a couple of different projects, but this one is a new play called The Cottage. Okay, so what can you tell us about it? It's uh, six English characters, that is real, yes, we're all, uh, we're all British. Let's hear and, um, No, I, I've already done it about eight times <laughs> yes, during the course have. of this interview. But, um, so Jason calls me up and says, <laughs> listen darling, uh, suddenly we've got a theater, and We've got to go, and the leading man has dropped out, and we go in June, and can you take over? I said, how much time do I have to think about this? And he said, about a day and a half. 
So this was about, I don't know, four weeks ago. And oh, this is yeah, brand, brand very brand new. Very brand new, and I read it, and it's, it is a hilarious uh, comedy of manners, very Noel Coward, uh, three couples that everybody's sleeping with everybody But else. this is where, it's modern. It's mo it's, no, it's set in 1923, oh. but it's a new play. Uh, only been done a couple of times regionally, so never it been. It's a play it, of manners. It's a play of manners, yes. Uh, and wow. it's, uh, it's very, very funny. Um, written by uh, a, a young woman named Sandy Weston. And it's... And how it long is your, is your run? Four months. So we're running July 7th. We start previews through till just before Halloween. So well, we've been talking about going to New York. We're going. We're going, we're going, going to New York. We're going to the Helen Hayes Theater. We are going to New York. So you've got a lot of things going on. Okay, so you... You have so many shows. I'm like, so Travelers. So you're like the Mulder character. I, you're very like that. Mm -hmm. So is, is it, is, was it fun for you to take on this much straighter, yeah. more serious? Yeah, at that point, so that was, I, I had done a, a series um, called Perception from 2012 to 14, which was really rewarding. Uh, Rachel Lee Cook and Scott Wolf, and I had, um, I had played a professor with, uh, with a schizophrenia, and uh, so incredible challenge, uh, and I was a producer on it, I was, had a great connection um, with Ken Biller, who created the show. But it was really exhausting, and it was essentially a crime-solving show in the, in the end, so when that ended, I, I sort of thought, I, I know the next thing I do, I'm not crime-solving, I just, I, uh, but, I, oh, but I was, no, but I did want to do drama, I really, really did, and Travelers, Came along at just the perfect time and um, created by uh, my friend Brad Wright. And I just, I, what I love about him so much is that it, this, the Netflix model, the fact that it's still there. I can tell you right now, if you haven't seen Travelers, all three seasons exist on Netflix. Which is fantastic. And I'm really proud of it. I think, um, I'm not really a sci-fi guy, but this to me is very smart sci-fi, it's not space opera, it happens now, and the young actors in it are incredible, I'm the old guy, and, <laughs> and, the old guy. and it was the, really the first chance I had to play a real sort of, not I mean straight, I mean like straight up and down, r r sort of rigid leading man, very serious, very quiet, I had to, f I had to fight all of my natural, all of this that I'm doing now, <laughs> I had to work really hard to stand still and be the leader, and wow. uh, and it was I loved it. I loved it. I loved Somebody it. got on the thread uh, today and was saying that they just saw you from a uh, monk, where you played the murderer, and that it was really hard to watch you be this bad guy. I've been the bad guy a bunch of times, and it, that allows me to promote another show. Let's go. That I'm very excited about. This happens in a month. Okay. Uh, it is uh, the fifth season of a show called Slasher. Which some people might know, it's from the sh it's on the Shutter Network here in in the U.S. Um, but we produced it in Toronto. Season five, they asked me to come in. It's kind of a company of actors that does the, the show every season, but it's it's always new characters. Okay, they, now wait, where is this going to be for us? For he, it's, it's called Shutter with two D's. Shutter, okay. Shutter. The Shutter Network, which okay. I believe is through uh, it's through AMC down here. Okay. Um, and. Uh, and it's all—it's always—it's basically a slasher film in eight episodes every every uh, season. But this one is set in 1900. It's like Jack the Ripper. Oh, I love that. And so the costumes are great, but I get to play the worst bastard I've ever played. Oh, I'm so excited! Oh, I can't wait God, to see I this. It. I loved it. So I believe it premieres uh, April 6th. Um, and can we um, get this on our yes, things? Yes, yes, I think it's through, it's through, I, I, I have to look at AMC. It. We'll, AMC, we'll, we'll AMC is, the, uh, is our mothership and, uh, And, and so, alright, so there's also something that you did a couple years ago that came out a year ago that has gotten a lot of acclaim drink water, and I'm also a, a departure character for you. Yeah, this is... Uh, it was COVID had been happening for seven, eight months, and everyone was going bananas locked up in their house, and I got an offer to go back to Canada and do what I think is the most ultimately Canadian film of all time. <laughs> it is so Canadian. Uh, How so? Why so? It, it takes place in a small Canadian town. It's, it's Canada for Canada, which mm -hmm. doesn't happen a lot. Um, the, the town is called Penticton, where my wife actually spent her summers. And uh, it's kind of a coming-of-age story, almost like a John Hughes kind of film, except very sweet. Very sweet. 
but it, all, all the music is some of, some of the great hits from uh, Canadian hits from the eighties, and and I just get to play a real sort of insurance guy's, fraud. Guy. <laughs> yeah, he's one of those guys that just uh, he's, you know, rips off the government and uh, you know, lies a lot, and he's not not a great dad, not a great dad. Fancies himself a pretty good dad, but and I got to I just grew this big mustache. I just, I just loved I loved him. I love the character. How Hank, fun is Hank, that? And uh, it's now, um, if you're in Canada, it's on um, Prime Video, anytime you want. And I'm hope, hopefully it's coming down to the States on uh, hopefully Amazon or something. So. I hope that's so. And so also, Michelle sent me something very funny that <laughs> the other black girl on Hulu is coming up, right? Okay, are you the other black girl? Now come on. No, I'm the first black girl. The first black um, girl. No, this, uh, so this is, uh, I've been waiting to talk about it because it doesn't, happened for, for months. It's, uh, I think, oh, for months. late September Okay. Uh, for Hulu, on Hulu, uh, for Onyx on Hulu. Um, but it's based on this uh, best-selling book, um, this young uh, black woman's first novel, Out of the Gate, fantastic, mm. about, sort of about her experiences in, uh, in climbing the, the ladder in publishing. But it, the feel of it Mm -hmm. It's almost like a Jordan Peele thing. It's 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 very Ooh. funny, it but dark? it's dark. It's oh, very no, dark. We love dark. We love dark. And, and it's very much about uh, racism, but it's it's. Oh. I mean, it's I, I, it's hard to describe what it is. Um, and who are you? I'm. I guess if in the in the Jordan Peele comparison, I'm kind of the Bradley Whitford. Uh, I'm, we love Bradley yes. Whitford, West Wing. And, yeah, there, there you go. You go. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm the I'm the publisher. Uh, I'm, I'm the guy that runs the publishing firm and. Uh, and the two, three really young black women that star in this show are stars. They're oh. stars. So Did you I'm, see Till, wait. by the way? I've not seen Till yet, no. Okay. Maybe my favorite movie of the year. Wow, okay. Then I, then I will. Have you seen it, Michelle? Spectacular. Absolutely um, do that. But anyway, on similar... Yes. Um, but anyway, I, I think this show, uh, and that is the title, The Other Black Girl, is yeah. going to be... Talked about a lot. I'm come, so come excited. September. Yes. September. And it's going to be on what? On Hulu. It's, it's, it's a Hulu. On, on Hulu. Yeah. Okay. A Hulu. And so how is it for you? Do Okay. So I saw the, I, I came to a taping of the reboot with my daughter, which was the thrill of a lifetime. Um, how is it from for you going from network and all of that to doing Netflix and doing Hulu? And how, how is that a different experience for you? Because it must be. I think, I mean, there's nothing to compare with, first of all, the network experience of, of yesteryear, <laughs> when they had tons of money and, and, uh, and you know, I mean, when you think of just the wardrobe on Will and, uh, Will and Grace alone. Craig, hi! They, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Lori Eskowitz and the money she had to spend on those girls. Oh and, my and, uh, gosh. I mean, that doesn't happen in quite the same way anymore, but it's, I think it's all about, it's about... How, it, how it starts. What, what is the script? Who, 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 who's running the show? Mm -hmm. The rest of it is, is bells and whistles and, and ultimately it's about what the, um, how much promotion you get or don't get. But the, in terms of the show itself... Netflix can be tough with that. They can be tough with that. It was, we had to, you know, with Travelers they were incredibly supportive and hands off. Which I was going to ask you next. Yeah, they, no, they, they very, very much allowed us, them. particularly by season three, mm -hmm. uh, they, they allowed Brad to, to it's been a very complicated tale, but it's also hard when you know if mom and dad have a thousand children. It's hard to get their attention, and sometimes right. Like, and so what, we get one billboard. Right, so they're putting they they put it up there as the featured thing for like a day. Yeah. right? it goes on everybody's main thing. You know, and it was that was frustrating. But the flip side, it's still there somewhere. There you go. It doesn't go away. It was perception is hard to find shows that one did in the all, all day sometimes, but. Uh, I urge people to see Travelers simply because I think it does tell uh, over three seasons a really, a really great tale. Okay, so before we get to the other, there's uh, two other new things cooking. You know, I never do this. I never sit here and promote shows. That's not what this show is about. I just sit and dish with everybody. That's no. all I do is I just want to dish. So we have to dish a little before. Yeah. Okay. So what were you doing when when COVID happened? What were you in the middle of? What? what how did your life change, and how did it impact you and Janet? You know. It, it feels very strange to say this now in light of all of the tragedy that happened with COVID, but in you some loved way, it. I didn't love it, but I, <laughs> but it couldn't have happened at a more convenient time. How so? We just finished the reboot of Will and Grace. So right. I had worked steadily. I'd done Travelers and Will and Grace at the same time for two years. That? 
Thank, thank you, Netflix shared me with NBC and, and vice versa. And wow. I was, it was fantastic. I loved it in two different countries. But so I was ready for a break. Do you, you must do you have a really good memory. Like, how did you learn all those lines? How did uh, you do I, that? I, 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 I do. <laughs> My assistant's off camera going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a good memory for lines. Wow. <laughs> Otherwise, I have an assistant. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, that, if, if, if it's something I'm memorizing for work, yes, I do. But I was ready for a little break. And then the day, this is so true, the day that it was official lockdown, I think it was March 12th. We're, we're coming up on three years right now. That's right. Uh, I was on my Vespa and I was hit by a car and I was thrown and I broke my ankle. Oh! So the day that everyone suddenly had to stay in their homes, I had to be in my home anyway for six weeks. There you go. And I couldn't walk. So it all sort of began in this strange way. And then I felt so bad for my kid. It was, he was nearing the end of his 11th grade. Oh. And so all of that, and then all of 12th grade oh. at home with us. Yeah. Shitty for him. Yeah. But and no graduation. And no graduation. I'm kind of a bit of a prom because mm. that, that's, the timing worked out that way. But for us to have him... Mm when he would otherwise have been out partying with everybody else in 12th grade. To have that time with him, um, I mean, I'll always be grateful for that particular piece of time. Excuse and me. then when he started college, it was still going on. Were, were they, did they go back to class? When he started college, yes. It was oh, just, okay. again, like I say, perfect timing. They, they, there was masks and everything else, but they, but they did start back. He was able to go to the campus and start his college life. So... Um, and so how, how I lead the COVID crazies, that's, I was going live seven days a week on Facebook because I was stuck in the house and I had nothing else to do. Right. And then there were all these people out there that were stuck in their house and had nothing else. So we just did it together. And so... We did, a, we had versions of that. Um, we, you start, everybody I'm sure started Zooming with all of their friends and now I'm, I'm a little over the Zoom. It's, uh, yeah. it's like, this, this is, is so why I'm here nice. with you. So I said, now we'll come to your house. Um, <laughs> But one thing we did uh, that Michelle, my assistant, is, was very much a part of, um, we figured how do we do something for fun once a week, but we have to be outside, it has to be safe, which is easy when it's Los Angeles. But we started karaokeing outdoors. Oh, stop! <laughs> with about four other couples, and they'd come to our yard on a Saturday night. And uh, we would stay far <laughs> apart from each other. We wiped the mic constantly. I mean, we were very, very careful. Wow. Uh, and pretty much the, the rule for the first few months was if you have to if you have to pee you got to go home you can't you can't go in the house <laughs> we were very strict but we would do we, did we, your neighbors all come out to well, the neighbors you? were sort of oh, they would come over so it was perfect um, and we loved it but one of the first nights that we did it I had taken uh, Copacabana and rewritten all the words to uh, COVID Cabana and so that's what we called ourselves. <laughs> The COVID, COVID Cabana, and so um, and that's what we, for, so for two years, that's how we kept our sanity, through almost every Saturday night. I love, okay, so speaking of COVID Cabana, so you know I just met Barry. Oh, so we have to talk about Barry. We now. have to talk about, so how did you become friends with Barry? Um, Barry, so the first album I kind of knew, top to bottom, because of my friend Bill, was we'd be playing Get Smart, and then we'd hear his older <laughs> sister was she playing in there? It was the Barry Manilow live album. <laughs> so eventually we gave up Get Smart and we put that album on to pretend that we were Barry Manilow. <laughs> well, we couldn't both be Barry Manilow. So, so I, you know, Bill said to me, which one of us gets the... I said, Bill, you're my best friend in the world. I'm Barry Manilow. <laughs> you, you get to be Keith Loving, the guitar player. Um, there's a great story there. I'll tell you too. So, uh, but I saw... I, I guitar <laughs> So, um, so we, so I knew that album backwards. First year of Will and Grace, Deborah and I go to what was supposed to be Barbara Streisand's final concert in LA. It was not. There's been many since. Many. But I went up to sort of look and look at the orchestra up close before the concert started, and so did Barry Manilow. So I'm suddenly I'm standing side by side with Barry, and before I could open my mouth, he said, "Oh, I'm a big fan. I love the show." I said, "Wait a minute." <laughs> That is not how this goes. I've had this plan for a long time, for 20 years. You shut up, I'll start talking. So I unleashed. And that's how we eventually got him on the show. I just sort of kept in touch with him. Uh, uh, and, and, he, and how did you get to write a song together? How did that happen? Did you that get him to so karaoke? Nice. 
I never did. Um, I do a lot of Barry and Karaoke. <laughs> Barry Oakley. Because uh, <laughs> you're a fan of Well, he finally came on the show, and Fan Low was the name of the episode, which uh, I, I'm not sure who came up with that title, but I love that. Um, and uh, I remember him being really nervous. He was just like, I mean, he had two lines, as Barry Manilow. And, and he said, I don't know how you do this every week. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> you're Barry Manilow. <laughs> um, but then about the, fo the following year, NBC came up with this idea of releasing a CD. This was a long time ago. Um, of artists that had been on the show. Um, so, you know, Elton had been on the show by this point, and oh my uh, gosh. Uh, Britney Spears and Mad Madonna. They were just gonna, it was almost like a bit of a cash grab, really. They weren't, yeah, gonna, yeah, they yeah. weren't gonna do anything except license these songs. And I said, this is crazy. All four of us sang. Why don't we do a song with the four of us? And nobody else really wanted to. And I said, really? <laughs> I said, maybe really? I can do something. So I thought, I reached out to Barry and I said, what if we did like a duet together or something? And he said, great, we can choose one of my old songs. And I said, <clears throat> actually, I mentioned my bravado, right? I said, actually, I've written some words, kind of a love song from Will to Grace, would you look at them? And I, I emailed them to him. Um, and the <laughs> next day, I'm in my dressing room on, on the lot and the package arrived and it's, he's made a demo CD of him playing the piano, and he's written a, a, a melody that sounds a little like Mandy, um, <laughs> and he's singing my words, and I'm just staring, I'm just listening, oh and, and, and Harry Connick Jr. walked past the door and said, what's that? And I said, I think I just wrote a song with Barry Manilow. And he said, uh, sure you did. <laughs> And then kept walking. But, uh, but I did. And, and so we recorded it, and Barry didn't want to sing it. He said, you just sing it. You just, and so he played, this was Studio One at Capitol Records, oh Phil Ramone God. producing. Oh my God. And uh, Barry played. He didn't want to play. He said, I'll get somebody else to play. I said, no, you have to play on the track. So he did, and oh. all these great studio musicians. And, uh, and then I sang this song. Chris. Wow. It sold you know, 11 copies. No, but, but he's very proud of it. He said it's a great song. And well, he told I, that to me. I, he said, I mean, come he on. said, Larry, you've got to get the song to Vicky. You've got to get her the, you've got to you get see, her the that, song. That and the Don Adams story, that's, that's, that's my life right there. At 14, if you'd said one day you'd have the approval of Barry Manilow and Don Adams, I would say, and I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> so meanwhile, I found out after we left Barry that his name when he was born was Pincus. That is my mother's maiden name. He is my mishpacha. I mean, we might be cousins. Maybe. I know, and I didn't. If I would have known that in the green room, he'd be my best friend. But you got to look it up now. I get it. I got to go back. So <laughs> you got Pegasus uh, homework today. I got I got Pegasus homework. So okay. So in this land of, of oh, so did you go into supermarkets? Did you eat in restaurants? What did you? How COVID crazy were you or not? Oh no, we were we. We absolutely followed all the rules and and um, continue to. I'm mean, I'm still going to wear a mask on a plane. Uh, I'm going to be as careful as I can. You, but you eat inside of restaurants now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yes. but um, this is but you know, I've had concert. you know I've had five shots. I I did everything did I was supposed COVID? to do. No, I have never. Either. 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 I know. Yeah. And I know people that that you know. Uh, followed all the rules and still managed to get some version of it, but not nearly as severe as it would have right. been. So I don't know. My wife and I are just kind of, we can't quite fathom it. It's a really good it's, thing. But it's, it's great. Okay, it's so great. now you're going to come into my land and you're going to do podcasts. Not one, but two. And so um, one with, with the great, wonderful Stephen Weber. You guys are going to eat out. Tell yeah. us about eat out. So eating out with Stephen, with Eric Stephen is what it's called. And it will be premiering in a month, I think. Uh, Eating out. Is that right? I think this. I think, I think April 7th. We'll, we'll drop the first episode. That's my so, sober birthday. I'll be 21. Congratulations. We'll talk about that too. All but right. anyway, go ahead. Um, I, I don't have a sober birthday. No, but I, I, I <laughs> wanted to know, did you ever, um, you're in this business, did you ever, you never, you were controlled, you never drank too much, did oh, I've drugs, drugs, did I've all had, that? Uh, no, drugs never a thing. I've, I've uh, drank too much on many occasions. Because you put... You put you put no. marijuana in a turkey. It was marijuana. Oh in a no, that was. I heard a story. That somebody that was that was 1987. I was living with two guys at, at the Shakespeare Festival, and somebody put hash in the stuffing. 
not a good thing. That's the first of four times I probably I just don't I don't do it in, in life. No. Okay. But um, and drinking not a not a never, no, I, 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 but never I do a enjoy my wine. No, it does mm -hmm. not it's um, You're not an addict. Like, you don't um, have that thing. No, I, that's I, I would hate to give it up because I do enjoy it. I do enjoy my, my wine with the dinner, but um, no, why did no. you have to? You, you don't. All right, no, so eating out with Stephen Weber. So, um, so Stephen and I, Stephen played my brother on Will and Grace in two episodes. Known him a long time. In fact, the first thing I did when I got to LA, within the first week, I got, I stood in line and I got tickets to be in the studio audience of Wings. Oh. So I saw Stephen long before he knew me. And, and, um, oh, I love that. So uh, we, when, when we became friends 15, 20 years ago, I don't know. Um, we he, we started to just he'd invite me out to dinner with this friend or that friend and we've sort of grown to this we have this group of men now that we eat dinner with a lot. I'm gonna see some tomorrow night. That is I that saw is, one of your pictures. So Jason yeah, was Jason there Alexander right after and, Rob Mara who has done my thing. Yeah, Alfred Molina, Noah Noah Wiley, Spencer Garrett, um, um Lawrence Fishburne sometimes shows up. Jesus. It's it's this great group of wonderful guys and what uh, Sean Hayes had approached me and said, do you want to do something, do a podcast? Because Sean's uh, producing so many these days. And uh, I said, you know, I, Stephen and I have these conversations at dinner that I can see other people in the restaurant called leaning in to try to hear. And I thought, maybe that's it. Maybe it's just us having dinner with a couple of other actors. So we've done about 10 episodes. Oh, you've shot already. We, we, oh, well, we, it's just our role. You know, it's right. an actual podcast. We're not doing what you're doing here. Right. right. Um, but yeah, we've recorded uh, nine conversations, I think. Our so first, who's our your first, first guest? Our first episode is LeVar Burton and Richard Kind and Steve. What and an I. interesting I combination. And, uh, and we just yak about all the theater and first breaks and, you know. Is it of, about the food at all? A little bit. Do you, you don't go to restaurants? Well, that was the idea. It's as if we're in a restaurant, mm -hmm. but there was kind of COVID. So, so you, br you bring in the food? Yeah. Um, and so do you, talk, do you bring in food from restaurants that you love? Well, we tried that. That's <laughs> it's very hard to organize because everyone's, it's hard enough to organize microphones and headphones. Right. So for right now, we just say, bring something to eat. <laughs> and uh, as, as Stephen says, it's going to be a, a hellish uh, podcast for people with misophonia because nobody can hear us chewing as we speak. <laughs> But, um, Do you eat? We eat. You eat. Okay, you eat. So, you so eat. that'll be fun. That's just, that. That's just a really fun one. The other one that it, we're just starting. Sean came to me and said, like the guy has not enough to do already, and says, "Wait, um, I have to think." Wait, what's the name of the one that he's that you were on with Stephen? An acrophobe? No, not an acrophobia. Oh, it's, uh, it's called uh, a hypochondriac. Hop, hop. Hypochondriac. Actor, which was which is just uh, Sean and and his uh, doctor friend who are um, he's he's fascinated by all things medical. But the big one he's on, of course, is Smartless. So this new one is produced by Smartless which the Media, three of them is, yeah. and it's just Sean and I rewatching Will and Grace. And the fun of it is that I I've never sort of lost touch with it. I, I, I if it's on, my wife and I will watch it. So Much great. to my son's chagrin. <laughs> you're, really, you're just going to sit and watch yourself on television? <laughs> but Sean hasn't. Sean's oh. husband loves the show. Sean has not watched it. Oh. Almost ever. Wow. Yeah, he certainly didn't watch any of the reboot. So I said, that'll be the fun. We'll watch it, and it'll be your response, seeing yourself again. So we've watched the first few episodes. This will come out in June. Uh, we're calling it Just Jack and Will. And, um, and, uh... And it'll just be us reacting, and then we're going to have guests on. Some of the big stars that we had on hopefully will come and join us. And it'll just be a kind of, looking back, because it was 25 years ago, Crazy. To, to the, almost to the day, that he and I met. It was, it, it, and next week it'll be 25 years to the day that we shot the pilot. So, so w can you tell us, like, what was his first reaction watching Oh, he, well, first of all, he, I, I, as I said, he looks like a fetus. He's, he's just, he's so young. He was so much younger than the rest of us. Oh, really? Um, yeah, he was like 27 or something. I was 35 when we shot the pilot. So he was a young guy that had everything ahead of him. He, he had two Super Bowl commercials that year. He was in two different ones. He just had a movie, a big movie come out. So it was sort of talking about the, the things we remember about the commitment. Me committing to that show was very different than him committing to that show. Because he had a lot of other, I wouldn't say options, it was mm. the best script out there, but he could have had people around him going, you've got a movie at Sundance, and you can do, do anything you want. Whereas for me, I, I knew a good thing when I saw it. 
Well, eventually. So, okay, so um, um, you've done a lot of things. You've played a lot of roles. You've been on Broadway. You're going on Broadway again. You're doing a podcast. Is there anything that you haven't? Is there any more to that dream that you haven't lived yet? Because you're a manifester, so you need to mm. say it out loud. Yeah. Um, this, this, this one coming up that, that Jason offered me is, is a weird one because that was the last thing I kind of manifested was I'd mm. love to do a, a premiere, a, a, a Broadway premiere of a new comedy. And originate the role. Yeah. And have that. Well, like I said, it's been done in a couple of regionals, but this will be the, the Broadway premiere. And I just, so that... That's a big one. I uh, we're, we're working on developing a few television things that I, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do next because I love doing series. I love knowing my crew. I love having a cast that uh, I love having writers that that are going to surprise me week after week. Um, but at my age, choosing the role that you want to be, you know, in success for years. Um, is, is suddenly it's not, you're not just a kid going, well, what do you got? I'll play everything. Now it's, it, it kind of matters. Well, um, I hope there's another comedy in your future. I, I think there, there will be. There Certainly, has to be more of this. <laughs> there may, there may be. Um, I don't know the, I guess, I don't know what's happening with the sitcom this week. You yeah. know, it's like a year ago it was dead and now suddenly they're saying, oh, the four camera system, the sitcom is back. And so I don't know. I, I do know that I loved it and a, Big part of the reason I said yes to Broadway was because I miss being live. We were in front of an audience for every episode of Will and Grace. It was, it was nothing fake there. That was 250 people that couldn't wait to see those characters, and it, I miss that so much. So I was one of those people in the audience once, and but I wasn't there for this. But you did Freddie. Mer okay, what possessed <laughs> you uh, the, to to do Freddie Mercury <laughs> for the studio audience in, with full commitment, full. What was that? Well, first of all, let me tell you the story so you understand where this comes from. Okay. This is all I did in my bedroom from about the age of 13 <laughs> through 19 at my, my parents, my, at my parents' house. When I was 16 years old, I had become good buddies at Baskin Robbins, my, my first real job, with a guy named John, and uh, he wanted to have a party for some of the girls we were meeting through the, uh, through the shop and, and their friends. Through the shop. So we had a... Uh, we had a party in his basement. I said, we can't just have a party. We have to open with something. So <laughs> we got dry ice. We actually went and found dry ice. I bought tights from a dance store. <laughs> and um, I figured out how to do a half microphone stand. And we performed, much to the chagrin of all these stone 16-year-olds. <laughs> he had his guitar. I was full Freddy. We did Tie Your Mother Down. We, we lip synced. Song was this the other st the story you were going to tell me before about your friend who didn't get to be, um, wait, he didn't get to be somebody, you got to be him so that he could Oh, play different, the different, 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 oh, different. I will okay. tell that story because that, that's a good one. So, so this is, I've been pretending to be Freddie Mercury in front of anyone that will watch me for a very long <laughs> but time. But you look great. I mean, you're so good. So, yeah, we, and so that Freddie's a big one for me. So, uh, we did an episode where uh, Will actually comes in as Freddie, which they wrote for me because they know how crazy I am. <laughs> And uh, and so all, it turned out just to be a sight gag. I burst through the door and kind of went, Ayo! 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 and the end of gag. But between setups, the uh -huh. uh, the guy who was in charge of all the music for between scenes, keeping the audience happy, put on "We Are the Champions," and I just you just did it. I just had to do it. Oh my God! It was so much fun. So fabulous. Here's the story I love. Okay. <clears throat> so. I told you before that I said to my friend Bill, I get to be Barry Manilow. Yeah, right. I said, well, who am I? I said, and I looked at the credits on the live album, when you can be Keith Loving. He's the guitar player. <laughs> All right. So we really did this for like a year and a half. Anytime we had his parents' basement to ourselves, we were putting on the whole album. And between songs, there's all this applause. It's a live album. So I would stand there staring at his panel walls as if it was 10,000 people. And I'd bow. I mean, I was very, very into it. And... I, of course, I stayed in this business. Bill did not. Bill was, you know, by the time, 11th grade, he was going to be an engineer and a very smart guy. Um, 2006, Will and Grace has just ended, and I did an off-Broadway play, and Bill called and said, I want to, uh, we didn't talk that much anymore, that I want to come down and, uh, and see it. Oh, my God, so we came down, and there was, I haven't seen him in so long, and he saw the play, it was the closing night, and I said, it was so great to see him, and I hugged him, 
The next morning, my wife and I, my infant son, were, he's four, I guess, we were leaving New York. We were getting into the car, and this, uh, the driver got out. He looked like a much older Sammy Davis Jr. He was a very elegant, very small um, black man that got out and said, oh, let me get, I said, please. He said, no, no, please. And he put the luggage in, and we got into the car, and I look into the front seat to see who I'm dealing with, I want to say, and, and the license says, Keith Loving. <gasps> Stop! And I, I said, are you, are you Keith Loving on guitar? Because that's what Barry, that's what Barry says in the album, Keith Loving on guitar! So I said, are you Keith Loving on guitar? And he said, yeah, man, that's me. And it turns out he played for Gregory Hines all these years, who had been on Little Bit. And I had just seen Bill the night before wow. for the first time in 10 years or something. Wow. And I got to meet the real Keith Loving. And he was a, a, just a wonderful man, and I got the, I, was, I don't know, it just, it just floored me to think of the, co the coincidences that. of life uh, are my favorite thing. Well, this was not a coincidence because I've been begging Lauren for years <laughs> to make this happen. So thank you so much oh, for you. for saying yes and for coming to my house. This is I love this. This is, like I say, I, I, enough with the Zoom. If, if I can do it in person, it's, uh, it's so much more fun. Well, I have. Um, you have exceeded all expectations. <laughs> He's even better looking in person, no. more charming, more wonderful. Looks fabulous. He's very um, I, those I, that have heard those stories before, I'm sorry, but they're, they're, no, they're the best I got. No, they're fabulous. Thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I hope we get to, to, to karaoke or Paul Williams yes. or Lauren. And no, Vicky promised you'd have Paul Williams over, and if you know me, you know that <laughs> Phantom of the Paradise is in my top ten films, and I'm going to make him sing those songs with me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure. Mm -hmm. ah. Thank you, Thank Snuffy. You, Snuffy, Snuffy on camera. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Bye.